have to confess it's the first time I've ever uh, standing here in this theater. I knew about it and I know about its history and I know it is uh, one of the remaining real strong fortresses of cin cinema culture, which uh, is slowly disappearing, but I, it cannot disappear as long as this theater is alive and kicking and showing films and having such a loyal audience like you. So that's a foundation upon which uh, I have been able to make my films. And it has been uh, a bastion of uh, uh, some sort of, not only a bastion, like almost a beacon, some sort of a light somewhere at the distance where I always knew uh, you have to aim at this light uh, and things will be fine, things will fall in place. Because of a theatre like the Coolidge, I have never been worried, I have never been afraid, no matter what the situation was. Introducing this film is, is easy, yes, there were certain risks. I uh, didn't have any problem with that. Uh, and I had a very capable man with me, Clive Oppenheimer, who is a very distinguished professor for uh, volcanology at Cambridge University. And he's such a wonderful presenter and such a wonderful character that, of course, he had to be in the film and he contributed to such a degree that uh, he, I, I said, you have to be co-director, named co-director, and he really deserves it. Uh, so it's one of the of the things that um, were hard to do, physically sometimes hard to do, but at the same time, uh, it uh, was easy for me to uh, face uh, volcanoes and face certain situations and create some excitement about science. You will see, for example, Ethiopia. There's a segment about Ethiopia, which has very little to do, of course, it has to do with a volcano and a volcanic area, but it's a, the excitement, the kind of excitement about science. We were lucky, uh, we came there for filming when, uh, for the third time ever in history in the last 150 years or so, uh, human remains of very early Homo sapiens were uh, discovered and uh, uh, taken out of the sand. Uh, so in the, the kind of excitement is exactly the kind of excitement I love when I see a movie and passing on this, this deep excitement to an audience. That's a great joy for me. We are here with Herb Golder, who has actually worked with me on uh, six, seven or whatever films. Uh, his day job is his professor for classics here at Boston University. And we will be here for you for your questions after the screening. So please enjoy the volcanoes and we'll see each other uh, after it. Thank you very much. I just wanted to thank the Coolidge for putting this up on the big screen. For me, it's just breathtaking because I only saw it on Netflix and um, the images are just as astonishingly powerful. And as I was watching, I was reminded of um, the, the, the epigraph that begins Lessons of Darkness, that the collapse of the stellar universe will occur like creation in magnificent splendor. And, and it, it, I just have a sort of three comment which questions. Which, by the way, which you wrote is attributed Bla Blaise to Pascal. Pascal yeah, yeah, but it's not Blaise Pascal, the French philosopher. Right. I wrote it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but Pascal couldn't have done better himself, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, just a couple of things occur to me as I'm watching this now, um, a, a third time, actually. You know, I always have the feeling that you're, in so many of your films, the, the, the abyss is just on the edge of your, your, your horizon. You're, you're sort of looking over into the abyss. Uh, for instance, I, I was reminded watching this that I uh, happened to be with you in 1994, I think, in Verona when you staged a production of, of, uh, of Norma, Bellini's Norma, in the uh, Roman amphitheater. 
and in the in the uh, libretto, she jumps into a burning pyre at the end. But Werner had her jump into an entire volcano. Uh, in fact, that was the set. It was a volcano that was erupting gradually throughout the production. So I, the volcano and so many of your films, I mean, Into the Abyss, um, Lessons of Darkness, La Soufrière, and so forth, either literally or metaphorically or staring into that heart of darkness uh, that, as you said, is the impermanence that's right under our feet. And the other thing that uh, d that I was thinking about and was sort of a common question, but again, like so many of your films, um, it's, it's uh, how belief systems are formed as well. It's, it's a, in a one sense, a scientific expedition of discovery, but at the same time, you're looking at that deeper strata of myth and superstition and belief and how values and belief systems come to yeah, be. Cre creation of gods. Yeah. Of course, Iceland, it's about destruction of gods in the right. Edda poetry, right. so about a thousand years back in time. Uh, North Korea is very obvious, a deity being created. Uh, the leadership has uh, godlike qualities. Kim Il-sung, the founding father of the uh, North Korean uh, nation, the regime there, uh, is, is clearly endowed with uh, these kind of powers. And it, it went to his son and now his grandson, who is not as firmly established as, uh, as a grandfather, for example. But um, it's interesting how, how things are emerging. Uh, same thing in, in Vanuatu. Uh, with a belief system, and, and it may be as bizarre as it gets John Frum, an American GI who will return and bring all the, the good stuff, fridges and chewing gum, maybe even a Cadillac, and there are no roads on this island. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's a, very, a, a very strange uh, form of endowing a god with uh, certain qualities. Of course, it uh, it has fascinated me, and of course, I had to be there and do right. this. Right, and and it's it's also fascinating and magical, and at the same time, ultimately evanescent because b under our feet is this boiling cauldron of ma yeah. magna that will ultimately destroy everything human and wipe it off the face of the earth. Yeah, but you you have to face it. You right. have to approach it, and you see in Vanuatu on Tanga Island there are these tiny two figures in this kind of uh, outfit, uh, heat resistant sort of outfit. There are two, yep. two m tiny dots of people going down. Uh, you can get, take a guess who is the front man <laughs> who is <laughs> right. stepping to yeah. the edge. Y you, you have to, to really see it and experience it and get close. Of course, uh, at the same time, you have to be prudent. We have to get away with the film, and when the lava eruptions, these um, glowing pieces uh, of magma came flying at us, of course, we knew get get just get out of there. Mm -hmm. It's getting too close. So there's always a balance between awe uh, on one side and uh, fascination and prudence. That's why I'm still around and still making films. <laughs> Because I've been prudent enough. Prudent, but you face the abyss. You face the no, abyss. No, I, yeah. I, yes, I try to to get as close to the edge as possible, and uh, it's not only physical. Uh, when you look at the films I made on death row, it's it's really a look into a human abyss, into the recesses of our uh, of the dark side of uh, what constitutes us as human beings. I've never been afraid of, of that. One more question, then I yeah, open okay. it up to the audience. Um, I thought that the, the scoring of the music was extraordinary. So could you talk a little bit about, did you have music in mind as you were working, as you were filming, or yes. did that all happen in post-production? Yes, it, yeah. it was always clear. Yeah. Much of it had to have a certain sacrality and also a, a, a sense of requiem. That's why I used uh, Verdi's part of Verdi's Requiem Recordare Jesu Pi. It's very odd because at the very beginning we had a phenomenally beautiful music and I ran into trouble uh, with um, the Ortho Russian Orthodox Church with a patriarch himself, like the Pope in Rome. 
uh, we were told, oh, there's no problem, uh, you can acquire this music, it will cost so and so much. The monastery and the uh, Archimandrit, the archbishop who is right under the uh, patriarch, would like to see what you filmed, how you are using it. Mm. We sent it and we immediately got a message from Moscow, you cannot use it, we are not allowing it. We have allowed it for all sorts of films, but not this one. And it, it's, it's a very interesting, fascinating discussion, which actually took place for years, for decades, in Russia in the early 17th century, uh, about the reality of hell. Hell, it was determined in the early 17th century, was a physical location, a physical reality, not a metaphorical place of fire and suffering. So, and we were told this particular piece of music, which fits perfectly, uh, has lyrics that clearly establish the voices are the voices of angels. And voices of angels cannot superimpose on the physical reality of hell. And we had a long, long conversation and debate over something that was actually debated in the 17th century. And it came, no, it, it's a very serious, it's, it's not, not funny at all, uh, even though there might be, you might find it funny. It has been a, a very, very serious discourse in, in the uh, orthodoxy in, in Russia. And finally, when it was clear uh, we could use it, I was told, oh, yeah, you can use it, uh, Russia cannot sue you in the United States and so on. I said, no, uh, this is beyond jurisdiction, the reach of jurisdiction, whether I love to have it in my film or not and whether it would be the perfect film, I'm just not going to use this, period. And what you hear now is a different type of choir which doesn't have an angels' voices. So you, you have to do these things and it's interesting that uh, it, it somehow touched in a very deep way the very nature, the soul of the Russian orthodoxy and, and the soul of many Russian people who are flocking towards orthodoxy now more than uh, for a whole century now. And you have to respect it and you have to step back and uh, and do what is right. So I wish I could have used yeah. uh, the, the perfect music yeah. uh, in, in the beginning, it's not there. It's still beautiful. It's still very beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. We should hand yeah, it well over to Yeah, well, let's open it up to the yes. audience. Some questions? Thank you, that was a wonderful movie. What is our obsession with lava? Why are we obsessed with lava? Uh, the reason why I asked this is because before I even came to see the movie, I'm going on vacation to a place where there's lava flow and I've been telling people this, and they've been telling me how obsessed they are with lava to the point where people have admitted they want to touch it. They, um, seriously, She's even one person. <laughs> yeah. Even one person. There people want to live with grizzly bears, too. <laughs> even one person who said that they wanted, they had this weird obsession with consuming lava. And this movie is beautiful. Why is it that we, is it because it's alien, because it's beautiful, because it's elemental? Why do we? Love it's it's lava. actually not alien, it's our planet. Let's face it, it's not anything alien. It's right everywhere we are on this planet, either under the seabeds or under solid a solid continent like the United States. Dig, drill deep enough and you'll have you'll have the lava. Of course it has a great cinematic quality, this kind of primordial raw force that's under us and that cannot be explained away easily. Which volcano are you going? I'm going to Hawaii. Oh, there, there are these new age, uh, stupid, pseudo-philosophical babblers around who think that they have to embrace the lava because it's so primordially natural. Tell them not only put your hand in it, jump in it. <laughs> We are honored to have you here. Re really enjoyed the movie. I have one question. Could you conceive of how these belief systems that you've identified would ever be overthrown? It's, an, it's a very fundamental and interesting question for me because 
uh, I've had a very dramatic religious phase in my adolescence, which disappeared very quickly. But I, I do understand somehow what is going on inside of humans. I uh, have become acquainted uh, with a, a Japanese former soldier who was the last one to uh, surrender 29 years after the end of Second World War on a Philippine island. He was not just hiding, he had uh, the order to hold to this small island, hold on for the return of the Jap Japanese Imperial Army because this was going to be the launching pad against Manila Bay uh, in the Philippines. And he uh, lived there uh, for 29 years and eventually, at a yearly basis or so, he would open hostilities, shooting a, a rifle shot over the heads of startled uh, villagers and then confiscate a few things. He said to me, you know, it's very strange because my case is something like uh, one of those cases where every single detail out in the world, how it manifests itself, formed into a quasi-religious belief system. For him, the, the war was still on after 1945 because uh, years later he saw uh, airplanes, bombers passing over him going west. In fact, that was the Korean War. Then a few years later, in the 60s, big bombers and B-52s again going west and for eight or nine years, and that was the Vietnam War. For him, it was clear the war was still on, only the theater of war had, had shifted. And every single little detail that he collected in observing the real world, he interpreted as a, as a puzzle element for a, a, a solid belief system, a, a almost, he said, like a religious belief system. And it was stunning for him to, to learn 29 years later that the war really had ended in 1945. It's a very fascinating question and it's, it's not only a single uh, solitary Japanese soldier on a jungle island in the Philippines. These belief systems are forming in, in other societies as well, including the United States. Thank you. When I first uh, saw this movie would be about volcanoes, I thought, wow, that's random. Uh, how does that connect? Um, and then, of course, you connect it to these deeper questions um, of, of faith and our history. And of course, that like carries over in other films, like Cave of Forgotten Dreams. And I guess I'm wondering, you know, do you have any sense of having a faith or a spirituality or like trying to drive those questions like through your work um, and even if it doesn't have to do with like a specific god um, you know a, a certain like spirituality around um, whether volcanoes or nature or, or something else well i think i should be very cautious to answer it because everything would be immediately misleading however i do i do know that there is something transcending in the images that i have created there's something that um, tries to reach out something higher or beyond us to something sublime. Uh, we have discussed sublimity uh, quite quite a bit in uh, ancient Greek literature. Uh, you, you find it uh, uh, quite clearly articulated 2,000 years back in time. I have the feeling that uh, uh, what, what I see reaches uh, beyond what our everyday reality is. Although realities are always somehow depicted, but something which is beyond, behind, beyond uh, the, the reality and facts is resonating. And that probably has made some of my films different from what you normally see on Netflix or see in theaters and see coming from uh, the film industry. Just uh, one clarification yeah. in case anybody's interested in the 
um, the Japanese soldier Werner was talking about a moment ago as Lieutenant Onoda, and there's a wonderful book he wrote called No Surrender. And it's, it's again, fascinating to see how that belief system crystallized that he, the war wasn't over and he had to hold his position until he received the orders to relinquish it. It's really just fascinating to read. Hi, so you talked a lot just now about gods and faith and in the film, I see scientists, um, logical, intellectual, bookish, let's say types on a pilgrimage, on doing, studying minutia on an epic level. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the the scientist and the motivation behind those who study small things and put themselves um, at a tremendous risk. Yeah, it, it was obvious uh, that there would be uh, somehow uh, emphasis on science in scientists because it was always clear Clive Oppenheimer would be the central figure in, in this film and he would be the guiding person and actually it was his choice to go to Vanuatu where he had been 20 years prior. It was clear <clears throat> we would go to Indonesia, to Ethiopia where he has been before. I followed his, his advice and I do not regret it because we always are quite often like in Ethiopia. Uh, we ended up with uh, scientists who do something only remotely related to research on volcanoes. Uh, the existence of uh, modern human man actually uh, occurred parallel to volcanic events in tools that were that were of phenomenal quality. Until today, for example, you can do eye operations with uh, this kind of volcanic material. It is sharper than any steel could be. So in the kind of excitement that you see how they are uncovering the, uh, the bone fragments. It's something that I would like to pass on to, to young kids who try to decide what should I do in my life. If, if there's one or two who decide I would love to go into science, then the film has made a, a point. And of course, uh, our lives wouldn't be as they are if we didn't have science and, and the great achievement of science. We wouldn't have a microphone, we wouldn't have cinema, we wouldn't have the internet, we wouldn't have any, any of that. Whether this ultimately is, a, is, is something great uh, or will lead to our demise uh, is another question. I do believe that leaving um, a nomadic existence behind uh, like 12, 14,000 years ago is one of the arch sins of the human race and it will bring our demise in the long run or in fairly short run. However, I'm not nostalgic and I'm not promoting that we should go back to, to a nomadic existence of hunters and gatherers. That would be silly. We cannot reverse what, what is going on. I always see science uh, with this uh, shadow of, of doubt whether it's really that healthy that we do it all the time. If I could just add one comment. If you, you <coughs> probably know Werner's film Encounters at the End of the World. And, and there, I mean, very serious scientists doing very serious research in a very formidable place. And yet every one of them is an ecstatic dreamer in a way. You know, the excitement you feel when they talk about their work, just extraordinary. And I don't know, science and art, I think Arthur Sackler said, they're two sides of the same coin. One's a passion pursued with a discipline, the other's a discipline pursued with passion. So they're both expressions of the human spirit, I think. And that comes through for me very powerfully in your yeah. movies. I think the volcano film itself has some sort it's, it, I'm, not, I'm not among the doomsday sayers, so or I'm not into that mood. I enjoy the world as it is. But at the same time, we know that the ground on, upon which we are walking is not completely solid. And nothing is for granted. Nothing, nothing. Things could happen to us uh, if we have only a fortnight uh, of an electrical blackout, because then our internet wouldn't function anymore meaning 
that nothing would function anymore, no food distribution, no distribution of water, no financial transactions, no gasoline that you can pump anywhere. You cannot go to a supermarket anymore and, and all of a sudden a city like Boston would be in, in utter chaos and turmoil and would be, would be lost. Only the North Koreans would survive. <laughs> no, no, they also use the internet, but, but not for the general population. But you know who would survive? The Amish. The Amish would survive because, I mean, the fundamentalists among the Amish do not use electricity. They do not use telephones. They do not use cars. They have their uh, buggies uh, that are drawn by horses. And they are self-reliant entities, agricultural entities. They would be the ones who would survive, certainly survive the um, kind of permanent winter, the moment the internet is shut off. Is there somewhere a lady, the men have spoken too much. Yes. In the past, I thought a lady would speak, <laughs> but she's next to you, who is she's very taking the photograph. Ah, she's taking okay. the photograph. Okay. So. All right. Let's let's just my wife. Let's just go ahead. In the past, you've mentioned that you found violence in nature, whether it be trees strangling themselves or birds screeching in pain. You've interviewed murderers. You've seen oil take over large swaths of the desert. Being that man is part of nature, do you think that we are naturally violent and on a path to self-destruction, especially here in this country where we're putting military superiority over intellectual superiority now? I wouldn't simplify it uh, when you speak about your country, that it's military over intellectual superiority. That's a sort of an antagonism that I cannot accept like that, it would be too simple, but I, I see what you are trying to say. Of course, uh, there's a certain danger when, when militarism in particular is uh, paired with uh, stupidity. My, my wife, Lena, has coined a beautiful phrase, but it was during the Bush administration when America invaded uh, Iraq. And, and there, she coined a very nice phrase, it's empty hearts and armed stupidity. So that's, that's very significant. If you have an empty heart, your armed uh, interference out there in the world can be very stupid and very dangerous. So uh, you, you have to balance it right. And I'm not in, in the mood of America bashing. I wouldn't live in your country and work in your country if I didn't like your country. Of course, I have certain ambivalences. And I know you all have a problem with uh, the Donald <laughs> at the moment. However, uh, you have to accept a fact that uh, he, he is the elected president of the United States. So it's, it's not so much uh, maybe that he's a problem. There's something systematic about him. And the sy systematic problem is that there's a forgotten part in America, the heartland, which I like a lot. And when I speak to friends who live in Boston and they talk to their f uh, friends in Seattle and Los Angeles talking to uh, uh, New York, they speak, they used to speak of the flyovers, the flyovers, everything in between. And I, find, I always found it cynical. And all of a sudden, the flyovers, the heartland of America, has reunited its voice. The marginalized, the forgotten ones, the ones that the press never talks about. And I think the, the real systematic void that is there is that you are not going, reaching out enough to mid-America. And almost everyone in Los Angeles comes from Iowa or Kansas or, or Tennessee or so. And I keep asking, uh, do you keep contact with your high school buddies back in Memphis, Tennessee? No, no, they should, they should. And, and I think it's, it's a long systematic project to channel things in the, in the right direction that 
there's more information, more discourse with the heartland, that there's more, not necessarily academic thinking, but just an exchange of informations, taking them seriously. And then all of a sudden, uh, America uh, will not do uh, things that might be dangerous in the long run. The problem is, uh, is Boston and, 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 not, and not Stevens Point, Wisconsin. As much as you may dislike it, uh, I'm one of those who uh, in some ways even likes Texas. I like Texas, there's something formidable about Texas. And I would be the last one to be in Texas bashing. It would be easy when I do eight films or nine films on death row inmates. It would be easy to bash the attitude of Texas. No, I don't do it. You have to look when, when you see a problem with militarism and absence of information society, I mean real information beyond Facebook, then you have to look at yourself and you have to look at where could the problem really be. I think the problem is not Omaha, Nebraska and Stevens Point, Wisconsin and Boise, Idaho. The problem is Boston and Seattle. I think we run out of time, so. <laughs> That's thank, thank you very much, uh, Herb. I, the, the last thing I wanted to leave this theater on, uh, with, with a tone of a preacher. I'm not, I'm not one of those. I'm a filmmaker and I enjoy what I do and I thank you for coming. And uh, <laughs> I will come with uh, uh, new films in the near future. See you again, bye bye. Thank everybody for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>